I'm Harmala Gupta and uh, almost 15-16 years ago I started an NGO called Cancer Support. Uh, it grew from my own personal experience with cancer as a survivor of Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I realized that there were so many people who had lots of questions that were going unanswered, who needed information, who needed reassurance. And I felt an obligation as a survivor to play my role in ensuring that people who were diagnosed with cancer, which includes their families too, because cancer is not a disease of just an individual, uh, would get timely information, uh, emotional support, so that they could make the decisions they needed to make. Well, you know, cancer is a funny thing because there are no obvious symptoms, which is what makes it very difficult to diagnose early. Um, I was suffering uh, from just a malaise, you could say, uh, feeling weak, having difficulty breathing, I was losing weight. But I didn't uh, think it was that important because I was doing a PhD at the time, I was eating erratically, so I put it down to that. And frankly, neither did the doctors. It was only when I uh, obviously began to have some kind of distress, which meant pain in my back, uh, that um, I went to a specialist. And the specialist looked at me and he said, I don't like the pallor of your skin. Would you please have a blood test done? And that's when it started because the blood test was not normal and they wanted more tests done. Uh, but it was a, 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 a sort of a, an irony that because I came from India, uh, for them, uh, they felt I was more likely to be a case of tuberculosis <laughs> rather than of Hodgkin's lymphoma, especially when they saw a lesion on my lung. Oh. Uh, but uh, to give them credit, uh, they didn't jump to any conclusions. Uh, they decided to uh, do all the tests one by one. And finally, it was really an open lung biopsy which established the diagnosis. Oh. But till such time, they were unwilling to jump into treatments either. And for that, I'm grateful. Because had they just assumed that it was TB and started giving me TB medication, I may have lost very important time. You know, I was 33 years old. Uh, I had a three-year-old son. So it was uh, uh, quite a shock. But uh, I think when you're that age, you also have a lot of resilience and a lot to live for and I and I at some level I was determined that I was not going to uh, l let this be the end that I was going to fight back and I'm fortunate that I had a family who stood by me um, I'm fortunate also that I had good medical care uh, that I got the emotional support I needed from my friends um, and uh, this was really a, a, in sharp contrast, may I say, of what was happening in India at that point, uh, and which is what impelled me finally to decide that uh, when I got well, uh, I would start to help other people. I saw this as part of my own healing. Mm -hmm. It gave a meaning to what I was going through. I think it's very important in life when you face obstacles, and they come in many forms, uh, to try and find a meaning because that meaning can help you turn what seems to be a negative situation into something positive. You know, it was curious when the doctors asked me in Canada what I knew about cancer. I said, the only thing I know is that cancer kills you. And they said, well, haven't you met any survivors? And I thought about it and I said, I've never met anyone who's had cancer in India. How is that possible? Uh, and so I asked him very innocently, is it because there's no cancer in India? And he started laughing. He said, of course there's cancer in India. So when I came back, my first uh, attempt was to find these people who had cancer. And I found that it was shrouded in secrecy, silence. No one talked about it. But people slowly began to hear that I was back, that I had been treated for cancer, that I seemed to be doing well and I began to get anonymous telephone calls. People wouldn't say who they were. They couldn't even say that word, cancer. They were so terrified. They just say, we have the disease you had. And can you please tell us how you coped with it or what happened? And this was an eye opener for me because in Canada, it was quite the opposite. People were open about cancer. They said, so what, you know, it's an illness, sure but uh, there are treatments for it. 
Uh, people would go to office, come back, have their chemotherapy in the outpatient department and go home. Wow. Uh, so there was a normalization that had occurred, which I realized was not here. And part of this fear was lack of information. People just didn't have the right information about their disease. So I realized that there was a big need here uh, that had to be met. And I'm fortunate that uh, I was able to mobilize a group of people around me who were compassionate, caring, who had experienced cancer themselves at some level. And that's how we got going. You know, I was in Canada, which has a marvelous public health system. I did not have to spend a penny on my treatment because I was covered for health insurance. My husband was teaching at that time. You know, I just think how awful it is because you already have this burden of the disease, you're, the possibility that you know your life is coming to a close and everything associated with that. And then on top of that, you're struggling with the financial side of it a double burden. Patients feel so guilty. My God, because of me, my family is suffering. Maybe my daughter will not marry tomorrow because all the money we saved for her dowry is being spent on me. My children's education is suffering. You know, so I really feel there's such a need to have a good uh, public health system that covers people for diseases such as cancer uh, so that this is not an added burden. People don't go into debt. Uh, they don't uh, go into depression because of it. They don't feel guilty. They don't get blamed. Uh, so I would definitely uh, want a universal health system in this country. Um, I would also uh, want more cancer treatment centers to be located in uh, closer to where people live. Unfortunately, at the moment, they're all in these metropolitan cities. People have to travel long distances. By the time they get here, their cancers are advanced because they have not got the right treatment at the right time where they live. They spend so much just living in this city, leave alone the cost of treatment. Hiring a place here, living here, eating here itself is another financial burden on them. So we need to have these facilities closer to where people live. We also need to have more compassionate, caring doctors, uh, doctors who uh, understand the trauma of a disease like cancer, um, who are open uh, with their patients, who uh, are able to communicate in an effective and empathetic manner. Um, and, and so I think if we can have this sort of a system which requires a change in the mindset, which requires a focusing, making the patient the main focus of what you do. Uh, for example, recently someone told me, and uh, that, you know, uh, they were looking in terms of starting new clinics for cancer in the cancer hospital. And the, the location of the clinics depended on what was comfortable for the doctors. I mean, it shouldn't be that way. In most places in the West, for example, it, is, it depends on what, how is it going to help the patient. Will the patient have to walk more? Then we don't want it there. Will it mean they have to rush around more? Then we don't want the clinic to be there. And so I think it's a needs a orient, a reorientation of how we view each other and uh, how we view especially a person who's coming to us in a very vulnerable situation. Uh, and we must do all we can to make that very difficult journey easier. And I, But I think universal health care, the government has an obligation here to provide it to everyone in this country. You know, I think to a large extent, it's how you face your illness. If you start playing the role of the ill person, you're giving a cue to everyone around you to treat you in the same way. However, if you decide that you are, you are going to carry on with a normal life as far as possible, uh, that you want people to look at you as the person you were, and then you take certain steps to make sure that happens. For example, you uh, laugh, a lot, you go out, you make an effort to go out, uh, you make an effort to carry on with your normal day activities as far as possible. I think once you do that, it will change perceptions. And that is one way in which we can break this wall. Uh, because uh, unfortunately, people around you uh, want to protect you and from the best of intentions, they often make you a, a, a kind of a prisoner in the home. 
and I think we have to resist that. Uh, we have to assert ourselves more. Uh, we have to uh, empower ourselves. We have to read about our conditions, condition. And really, I think it's about making the best of what you have. And that lies in your hand. You decide how you want people to view you. I think Red Health is excellent. It's a wonderful uh, initiative because people need more information. Uh, and uh, the internet platform is one way. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Um, have created a opportunity to people to get the information in their homes. And I think people are looking for professional, professionally vetted information. And I think this is what uh, Credit Health provides them. And uh, certainly I believe that if you have the information, you can make better decisions for yourself and for your future. So uh, I'm very happy that Credit Health has taken, as I said, a very meaningful uh, initiative.